Hmm. That's good. Oh, oh. <laughs> didn't see you there. Um, man, that's really good water. We're in module five, and we're talking about chapter 19, how chemicals mix. Um, but actually, one thing I want to talk about right off the top is how precious water is. How great it is to have a safe and reliable source of drinking water, right? If you know, think about the recent events in Flint, Michigan, where you know, there's lead in the drinking water and people suffered. Children perhaps are affected by not having a safe source of drinking water. Water has always been a, a kind of an important topic for me because I grew up, grew up in the middle of Pennsylvania and out in the, out in the boonies. We had, a, we had a well. We were always worried about the well going dry. And I've continued to my fascination with water. Uh, in fact, if you look up here, see that graphic there? That's something I did years ago when I worked at USA Today. Um, I wrote little graph. I did little graphics for the weather page, and this is one of them about rain barrels, collecting rainwater. Water is such a precious resource that we should always be trying to conserve it because it may not always be around. While I was at USA Today, I uh, became familiar with a fellow named Richard Heineken. And he had actually written a book. He lives out in Texas Hill Country, where they get very little rain. And when he moved there, uh, he drilled a well and found it lacking. And he started to collect rainwater, not just to water plants, but actually to drink and for, for washing clothes and washing dishes and washing his body. And he wound up developing a business out of it. I thought it was really cool. He actually wrote a book called Rainwater for the Rainwater Collection for the Mechanically Challenged. And there's even a DVD that goes along with it. And if you're interested, on the next uh, slide, I've got a link to a video that's going to introduce you to the topic of rainwater collection. But do pay attention in this chapter. Uh, it's called, entitled How Chemicals Mix. You know, water is a solution. So you're going to be coming across the, top, the topic of solutions, and concentration and eventually at the very end it'll talk about how detergents work as well as how to purify the water we drink and one of the purest forms is rainwater and so with that i give you richard heinigan the mayor of tanktown Tanktown was developed about 15 years ago to help people put in rainwater collection systems to have a better quality of life with their water. The options out here in the hill country are pretty bleak. It's either a well, city water, which isn't out here, or rainwater. When I moved out here, I drilled a well and found that my hair felt like felt like a fright wig and my jeans stood up like cardboard and I couldn't get the soap out of my hair. The water smelled like sulfur and I about threw up in the shower and decided that this wasn't for me. So I searched around and uh, ran into this guy named Mike McKelvin who started collecting rainwater out here in 1984. I searched around and found that uh, fiberglass tanks were the best things to store them in. I bought one and then built my system, not really knowing what to do. I didn't know really anything about plumbing, and, which is all this is, is plumbing. My neighbor came by and said, why are your dishes so shiny? And did you just buy those dishes? And I said, no, those are our same old dishes. Well, I want that. I know my wife does too. So I called up the tank guy and I said, I have a friend that wants to buy a tank. And, and they said, okay. And then another neighbor came by and he bought a tank. Then another neighbor bought a tank and Tank Town was born now, right at my house. We had put in 200 systems and we started selling tanks all over the country. We sent one to upstate New York and New Mexico and Colorado and it's just all over this country really. After living with the well water for a few years and meeting Richard Heineken, he convinced me that rainwater was the only way to go. 
These are 10,000 gallon nominal tanks. If we can get one inch of rain a month, we can keep them full. We're very fortunate. We get 3,000 gallons of water for every inch of rain. It's the same equipment that you would use for a water well. It's not rocket science. It's pretty basic stuff. There's nothing like rainwater. I tell you, once you use rainwater, even compared to Austin city water, uh, you won't want to use anything else. That's just regular tap water. It looks really good when it came out, right? But after it sits, that all the de all this debris that's in surface water, all water has this in it. And then this has gone through the filter systems. It's gone through all their purification. It's, a, it's as good as they could get, and it's and it was certified. It's okay by the government to get let people drink this. This is rainwater bottled in 2004. Well, it is basically just a drop of water. It tends to coalesce around small dust particles in the atmosphere and, and grow until it rains out. And it'll have dissolved constituents. There are minute aerosol particles. An aerosol is a very tiny drop or a very tiny dust particle that is just kept in the air because they're so light they don't settle down. And so the rain actually collects this material in its droplets. We took the little raindrop out using reverse osmosis, the little particle around the raindrop. We removed that. Well, they didn't. <laughs> One hot day, I was leaving work after I ran out of water to go home to get a new bottle of water. And I thought, well, hell, I should bottle this stuff. And now we have, we have another avenue for Tank Town. We've bottled water, we help people collect water. So we're just all about rainwater. You can't get better water. Water is in its purest form before it hits the ground. And that just makes a huge difference. And some people say that you've got to have, when you drink water, it's got to have stuff in it because you need the minerals. Well, that is so wrong. You should drink water for what's not in it. All the water from our aquifers, like the Edwards Aquifer, and indeed from the Colorado River, is rainwater. It's just had a longer time to flow through the soil, dissolve more mineral constituents, and so it'd be more saline. And if you go to some places where the water is very old, it's, or um, it's going through a certain type of rock, like it's going through rock salt, it becomes very salty and too salty to drink by our, our health standards that we have set. There's so little fresh water on this planet. Since the Colorado River doesn't flow to the ocean or the Gulf of Mexico anymore around here, we're not getting any more diluted water. And that's what's happening. We're getting big dead zones in the ocean because of no fresh water. We're too many people got too much pollution. We're sucking the water out of, out of the aquifers faster than they can recharge. So rainwater in the future will be the only bottled water you can get. It's a resource. It's, well, basically free. You have to get a collection service, a system for it, but it's something we should be using. And I think we're gonna see more of that in the future. If you tell somebody it's rainwater, they say, yeah, right, you know. They don't really believe it because they, they hear the stories how most of the bottled water is just tap water that somebody put in a bottle and put a name on it. Richard's is pure rainwater and it's highly treated and purified. I mean, rainwater doesn't need purifying, but he, he purifies it to the end. Everybody's interested in this rainwater now because it's, they know it's so precious. They're just starting to think about it, you know? With rainwater, it's, 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 it's totally, you know, it's just totally different. I can't believe I'm the first person to do this. It's crazy. They are becoming dead The ocean breeze brings the smell of progress and disease As I walk along the shore Things aren't like they were before And the ocean breeze is still the same And it's lost its name Up to this point, the chapters 15 through 18 have largely been dealing with stuff kind of on the microscopic level. We've been talking about atoms. We've been talking about molecules. We talked about how atoms bond together. Uh, 
essentially we've been talking about really small stuff. Chapter 19, we take a little bit of a larger perspective. We talk about things that we can kind of see and describe matter on that level, what's called the macroscopic level. And I'm not going to go through this two chapter and verse. Uh, you know, it's important you read through the first few sections of chapter 19 where they introduce topics such as pure substances, impure substances, uh, you know, what a mixture is. There's actually different types of mixtures. Uh, here's a nice little chart, essentially dividing all matter into pure and impure. And then from the pure, um, essentially it's just made up of one type of stuff. So it could be one type of atom, for example, gold. You know, if you just have one gold atom, well, that's certainly, we would call that an element. But also sulfur, uh, sulfur S8 or N2, you know, it, as found in nature, nitrogen is never just one single nitrogen atom. It's always two nitrogen atoms linked together through a covalent bond. Um, but that's still considered elemental nitrogen. So when we just, when we deal with nitrogen on the macroscopic level, the, the nitrogen that you breathe into your lungs, you're breathing in N2. So that's what we consider to be elemental nitrogen, and it is pure because it's just made of one substance. Likewise, you can have a pure compound, such as salt. Well, you know, sodium chloride. We deal with it. We put it on our on our popcorn, um, and it's essentially just that. You know, a a a uh, a little grain of salt is actually a bunch of salt molecules in a crystalline structure that you know nice cubic structure but it's all sodium chloride so it would also be pure it's a pure compound then we can once we kind of understand the pure we can also think about the impure or what are essentially mixtures so you can have homogeneous mixtures where um, they're pretty well distributed or you can have heterogeneous mixtures such as like oil and water. Well, in water, it mixes, but it also will separate if you give it enough time. Sand and salt. You can pick out the sand versus the salt pretty easily. Uh, homogeneous mixtures is a little bit tougher to see the individual things, but um, they are mixtures. It's, it's different. So of air. Air is actually a bunch of different types of uh, elements or compounds. So air is made up of, for the most part, nitrogen. 78%, in fact, is nitrogen. 21% is oxygen, there's carbon dioxide, there's, there's argon, there's other types of elements or compounds in there. And they're all essentially mixed together where one part of the, if I, if I grab one handful of air and grab another handful of air, it's all gonna be essentially the same proportions. So it's a, it's a nice, uh, nice homogenous mixture. Same thing with like milk. Milk, not, one section of milk is not any real, really any different than another section of milk. Um, but again, read through the just so make sure you go through the first few sections of chapter 19 to make to make sure you're clear on things like uh, pure substances, impure substances, mixtures. What's the difference between a heterogeneous, heterogeneous mixture and a homogeneous mixture? Uh, no terms such as solution and suspension. You know, you've got some of the jargon down, like uh, what is an element, what is a pure substance, all that kind of stuff. Go ahead and take a swing at the particulate nature of matter skills test. And again, this is a this is a sim bucket activity. So it's one where you're going to have to go through a tutorial, then you're going to take a quiz, and you're going to screenshot the result of your quiz to be the uh, thing that you upload to your instructor. So again, if you're not sure how to do that, watch this watch this tutorial video uh, before you actually tackle the skills test, and it'll kind of walk you through the interface. Okay, so we're moving on into section 19.3 about solutions. A solution is a single phase homogeneous mixture. So we just went through the definitions of what mixtures are, what a homogeneous mixture is. So take, for example, um, gosh, air, right? air that we breathe in. What is it? It's a bunch of different pure substances like nitrogen and oxygen, and together this uh, conglomeration makes up an impure substance. It's a solution. Um, and so what's the major component of air? Well, it's nitrogen, actually. 78% of the air we breathe is nitrogen. So in the case of air, we would say it's a solution of nitrogen, oxygen, argon, carbon dioxide, water vapor, where the major component is nitrogen. So it is the solvent. The solute are the smaller components. So oxygen technically is dissolved in nitrogen in the air that we breathe. Or take, for example, salt water. Salt water, the solvent is the water. 
the solute is the salt. Um, and it is a homogeneous mixture because, again, you take water from, you take a sip of, of the salt water from one part of the, the cup or the bowl or, and take a sip from another, and you really couldn't tell the difference. Same thing with air. Taking a breath of air from one side of my room to the next side of the room, I really couldn't tell the difference. So it's a homogeneous mixture. Okay, you really have to concentrate to understand this next section. This is section 19.4 about concentration. And that's essentially just a way of describing whether there's a lot of solute in a solution or not so much solute in a solution. So it's actually a ratio. It's the amount of solute divided by the amount of solution will give you the concentration. Now, if you have a lot of solute compared to the solution, you have what's called a concentrated solution. So for example, if you're making Kool-Aid and you put a lot of spoons of the Kool-Aid mix in there, it would be really concentrated, right? you know, almost sickeningly sweet. Whereas if you don't put much Kool-Aid in there, but you put plenty of water in there, you water it down, we call that dilute. So it's ways of describing how much those two words, concentrated versus dilute, are ways of describing how much solute is in there compared to the amount of solution. Now, how do we describe the amount of solute? We use a measure called a mole. Uh, if, you're, if you think about the periodic table, periodic table refers to individual atoms. And in fact, if you remember the atomic mass, the atomic mass is a value given in at atomic mass units, um, which uh, atomic mass unit is really just the mass of a proton. So the atomic mass of a particular atom is a really, really small value. Even the, the large elements like uranium and plutonium, if you just look at their atomic masses, it's, that's not very much because you're only, ta only talking about one individual atom, which we don't see. So a mole helps us to describe things uh, that are more on the macroscopic scale. We need to get a large collection of atoms or molecules together in order to be able to, to observe them. To, to actually take the mass of them. And so we, we use this, a, a measure called the mole. A mole is a number of atoms or molecules. And it's actually a huge number, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. So when you get 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd um, gold atoms together or carbon atoms together, that's gonna be a lot of atoms. That's actually going to have a mass that could be measured. And that turns out to be the formula mass of a substance. So for example, this formula mass of carbon, this is if you get 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd carbon atoms together, you put them on a balance, you're going to wind up with a mass of 12 grams. With oxygen, the formula mass O2, if you took, if you got 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd oxygen molecules, that means two oxygen atoms stuck together, put them on a balance, you're going to get a balance, uh, it's going to mass out at 32 grams. Carbon dioxide, CO2. Same thing, get 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd of these carbon dioxide molecules together, they're gonna have a mass of 44. Now, observe that the uh, a carbon atom has a atomic mass of around 12, right? So 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd of those atoms gives you a mass of 12. Oxygen has an atomic number of 16, right? Eight protons, eight neutrons, 16. You have two atoms together, that's where you get the 32 from. So really what you have to pay attention to is the atomic number of all these different elements. Carbon has atomic number of 12, six protons, six neutrons, has a, a formula mass of 12. Oxygen, O2, right? Eight protons, eight neutrons in each atom. At atomic number of 16, 16 times two, 32. Now notice carbon dioxide. What is carbon dioxide made of? It's made of one carbon and one O2, right? And we know the formula mass of carbon is 12. We know the, car the formula mass of, 32 of oxygen is 32. Well, what do you get when you add 12 and 32? You get 44. And sure enough, that's the formula mass of carbon dioxide. Let's do the same thing with sucrose. And again, if you have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of sucrose, and here's sucrose, it's got 12 carbons, 22 hydrogens, 11 oxygens. It's a sugar. 
if you put 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of the sucrose into one liter of water, you get a concentration of one mole of sucrose per liter of solution. And what is the mass of that sucrose going to be? Well, remember what the, what the formula mass of carbon was? Do you? It was 12, right? So we have carbon, which is 12. And of course, we know there are 12 of them. We have hydrogen, which has a formula mass of 1, because it's just got a proton in its nucleus, times 22. And then we have oxygen, which has a, for, a formula mass, a single oxygen atom, has a formula mass of 16, because there's eight protons, eight neutrons. So you just do the math. So 12 times 12 is 144. 1 times 22 is 22. And 16 times 11 is 176. Sorry, my 2 here looks like a 3. 22. And if you add them all up, you're going to wind up with 342 grams. Okay, here's a piece of chemistry jargon for you, molarity. Molarity is a way of describing the concentration of a solution. And you're actually going to need this in an upcoming lab activity. So make sure you do understand what molarity is. Molarity is the number of moles of solute in a certain number of liters of solution. Okay, so you divide the moles of your solute by the number of liters of your solution. And a common way of actually measuring uh, molarity is parts per million. So sometimes you're given, uh, it'll, you'll be given a concentration of concentration of a solution as being a two molar hydrosulfic acid. Um, or uh, you sometimes are given the measurement or the concentration, the molarity in parts per million. And this is the number of milligrams of solute in a liter of solution. So either way, because <clears throat> typically uh, there's not a whole lot of solute in a solution. Um, so you can describe it one part of solute, one milligram of solute in an entire liter. A liter is a thousand grams. So one thousandth of a gram of solute in a thousand grams of a solution is what one, one part per million uh, stands for. Okay, so earlier when I talked about having a concentrated or a dilute solution, I kind of gave the analogy of Kool-Aid. Right, well, you, here you're actually going to get a chance to make some Kool-Aid using this simulation as your lab activity. It's entitled Concentration, and you're going to be making different concentrations of solutions and checking your concentration using a concentration meter. So it is a simulation. Uh, you'll get a chance to, to play around with it. Watch the video. That'll help you understand the interface before you actually tackle the activity. Okay, one term that I happened to pass by earlier was the term saturation. Now, what does it mean when something is saturated? Uh, think about when a baby's diaper is saturated. That means it can't hold anymore, right? Well, that's the same thing in chemistry, is that sometimes you can have so much solute that your solution can no longer hold onto it. And so solubility is a term that describes the ability of a solute to dissolve in a solvent. And here's a graph that, that shows the solubility, the ability of a solute to dissolve, given in grams of solute in 100 milliliters of water. So that's what your y-axis is all about. It's grams of solute in a certain amount of solution. And notice that this is a graph that graphs that quantity with respect to changing temperature. So it's essentially the solubility as a function of temperature. And notice we have a bunch of different types of solutes. We've got sodium chloride, that's the green line. We've got potassium chloride, that's the yellow line. We've got lithium chloride, which is the orange line. We've got sodium nitrate, that's your blue line. Notice, for example, the, the sodium chloride, table salt. There's not a whole lot of change in its solubility, no matter what the temperature is. Yes, there's a slight increase near the tail end. When you get the water really, really hot, you can get a little more sodium chloride to dissolve in that solution. But more dramatic are the other salts and even the sodium nitrate. Check out the sodium nitrate. At zero degrees Celsius, when the, when the solution is pretty cool, you can, only, you can only get less than 80 grams of sodium nitrate to dissolve in the water. But take, for example, when you heat it up to 100 degrees Celsius, notice 
you can now get over 160 grams to dissolve. So you've essentially doubled the amount of sodium nitrate that will dissolve in that solution just by virtue of changing its temperature. So notice that when it comes to solubility, um, temperature sometimes makes a difference. It's not just a, a, a fixed value. You can change the solubility by changing the conditions. Eventually, however, you will get to the point where you can't dissolve any more solute in your solution. For example, going back to the Kool-Aid, you can dump Kool-Aid in, stir it around, dump Kool-Aid in, stir it around. Eventually you, eventually you will get to the point where you dump extra Kool-Aid in and it won't dissolve. The solution at that point is what we call saturated, saturated solution. And the extra solute will precipitate, it kind of collects at the bottom of your container uh, because you can't get any more of the solute to dissolve. Your book does a nice job in section 19.6 of describing how detergents work, how soaps work. And in order to understand this, you may need to go back and review those, the, those sections about intermolecular forces uh, from chapter 18, uh, where we talked about uh, ion-dipole uh, ion attractions and dipole-dipole attractions and dipole, induced dipole attractions, all that kind of stuff would be useful. Uh, so make sure you understand what polar and nonpolar means, because a soap is actually a little chain that has both a polar end and a nonpolar end. The nonpolar end attracts to the grime, as we're going to see in a little, in a little uh, diagram next. So it's the nonpolar part of the detergent molecule that attracts or attaches to the grime. And then it's the polar end that's attracted to the water. Remember, the water is a polar molecule. So a polar part of a detergent molecule is going to be attracted to the polar part of a water molecule. That's going to be a dipole-dipole. Relatively, relatively strong intermolecular attraction. So here's what you have. You have the polar end. So the nonpolar end of the, of the, here's the detergent molecule right here. All these little guys, they look like little caterpillars. Now, it's a nonpolar end, so you're going to have maybe a temporary dipole kind of attraction, a very weak attraction between the detergent and the grime. And that's where you, why you're going to need a lot of detergent molecules attaching to the grime, because each of their, each of their attachments is relatively weak. Of the intermolecular attractions, this is the weakest type of attraction, so you're going to need a lot of them attaching to the grime. And then you add the water, you wash out with water. And, and even though this is you know, all intermolecular attractions are relatively weak, but this is a dipole dipole attraction that's stronger than this one. So it's going to help to carry the grime away with the detergent when you rinse out. So that's how soaps and detergents essentially work at a chemical level. Okay, and then finally in section 19.7 talks about we're back to back to water, just just back to where we started from. Uh, how do we purify the water that we drink? How do we know that we have a safe and reliable source of drinking water? Well, I'm gonna, not going to go into this uh, in great detail. Your book does a decent job of explaining how it's done. Now, there's a little bit of chemistry involved, you know, because first of all, you have to just you know get rid of you get rid of the big stuff, but then you also have to get get rid of stuff that you can't screen out mechanically, and that requires a little bit of a little bit of chemistry. Um, and then, of course, you need to do some disinfecting. So um, the book kind of does a pretty good job of describing this. Okay, so we've already described how to purify water from conventional water sources, such as groundwater, where you dig a well and, and pump water from the ground, or from uh, surface water, lakes, rivers, that sort of thing. But what if even groundwater and surface water is hard to come by? What are your other options? Because this is this is the case in certain very dry countries, uh, the western coast of uh, Australia, around Perth, um, the Middle East, parts of the Middle East, and even parts of, of the United States are don't have a lot of groundwater, nor do they have a lot of surface water. So what are your other options? Well, you can convert seawater through desalination. Essentially, you're removing the salt from seawater. Now, how can that be done? It, it's a costly process, but sometimes in order to have a source of water, it's, uh, it's worth it. So you can either do, do distillation, where you essentially boil the water, leaving the salt behind, and then condense the 
fresh water that boils off. Or you can do a process called reverse osmosis. And essentially reverse osmosis is uh, filtering the water at a very, very microscopic level, submicroscopic pores that will allow water to flow, but not the salts to pass through. So that's another option. Again, it's a costly process, but it can give you fresh water out of what was salt water. And as always, I encourage you to, uh, to go through the readiness assurance test at the end of chapter 18, I'm sorry, the end of chapter 19 to uh, make sure you've understood the concepts.